Hello, everyone. My name is Acharya Shunya, and I am the leader of an ancient Vedic Hindu lineage from the holy city of Ayodhya in northern India. My lineage goes back several generations, and for thousands of years, we have been disseminating the knowledge from the ancient Vedic scriptures such as the Vedas, Upanishads, and Bhagavad Gita. Incidentally, I am the first female head of this lineage. And I'm also the first to teach in the West. I had a couple of organizations which are based in Northern California. And while I go back and forth to India, and of course, while teaching worldwide, I also appreciate the opportunity to share something from this rich tapestry of knowledge with the Theosophical Society. Today, I plan to share with you the deep teachings on Dharma from one verse of the much revered beloved text from the Vedic Indian civilization, the Bhagavad Gita. And you will find that spending time with this one verse deeply broadens your knowledge about what works for you and what doesn't in terms of what attitude should you embody in life. And those attitudes are not only going to make you successful in the world in terms of your relationships, but also advance you spiritually. You see, the Bhagavad Gita is an ancient text of 700 verses. And each verse is said to be loaded with insights, insights that elevate the mind and help us become more aware and tap into a greater consciousness, a transcendental state of being known as the self. Where is the Bhagavad Gita to be found? It's found in, coded in ancient scriptures known as the Puranas. There are 18 massive scriptures that go back several thousand years in the heartland of India known as the Puranas of which the third Purana is known as Brahma Purana. In the middle of this Brahma Purana, there are some 100,000 verses, which came to be known as the Mahabharata, the great story, which teaches us about life and morality and ethics and self-actualization and self-realization and such themes. The Mahabharata is divided into 18 chapters. And in the sixth chapter, uh, which is known as the Bhishma Parva, we have subchapters 25 to 42, where these 700 verses known as the Bhagavad Gita lie. And of those 700 verses, I will elucidate for you one verse. And you may, if you decide to receive this mindfully, find that this one verse has so much light and so much to offer humanity that you might feel quite pleased that you spend the time you did listening to the beauty of Bhagavad Gita as it emerges from my grateful being. Because I was born in a family that is organized itself around these scriptures. And my grandfather, my great grandfather, they were renowned Hindu sages, sadhus in the heartland of India. I grew up with these teachings. And of course, I was groomed to impart these teachings. And with great joy and great privilege, I begin the teaching on. The chapter 13, verse 8, 
of the Bhagavad Gita. And before I do that, I would like to just simply acknowledge the Guru Parampara, the Guru tradition, the, the lineage of a master teaching a student and then that student becoming a master and then them teaching a student until that knowledge reached me. So bear with me as I chant and then I will teach you what has been taught to me. Om Narayana Samaramba Vyasa Shankara Matyamam Asmada Charya Paryantam Vande Guru Paramparam Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha. While the word Guru has come under scrutiny in today's world, the word Guru really represents the one who sheds light on that which is dark within us. Gu means darkness, metaphysical darkness. And Ru represents light, metaphysical light of knowledge, of realization, of greater awareness. And it is deemed by the Vedas that each one of us at some point will find an outer guru to share enlightening knowledge with us. Knowledge that transcends our petty concerns, our trivial troubles, and the lamentations of our ego that never end and lead us towards a greater unity consciousness and understanding of how we are all interconnected and that how our ultimate life purpose is to flow divine love towards each other. And when that guru speaks, something will change and transform within us. Despite our ego wanting to hold on to its story of victimhood or suffering, something will grow within us. And that what grows within us is our own awareness, our own inner self-recognition. And at some point, the outer guru will become a conduit for the awakening of the inner guru, the self. The ultimate deepest message of all the scriptures of India of the Vedic time, if you put them together, then there are two core messages. And one core message is that we are meant to flow divine love towards each other, all beings, not just humans, but all sentient creatures share the same self. And as a result, we should interact with each other with sensitivity, with compassion, with consciousness. And all these teachings come under the umbrella of dharma. And the second set of teachings that are core to the Vedic tradition are not about others and how we interact with them and the world and Mother Earth, but really about how do we perceive ourselves? Do we perceive ourselves as this limited personality that has a decaying body and a distressed mind? Or are we able to explore and find a hidden invisible dimension within us, which is connected with the all? And that leads to freedom from the constraints of the ego. It leads to liberation from our tiny stories that begin with birth and end with so-called death. And it leads to ultimately self-realization. And this cluster of teachings is known as moksha. In the verse that I am going to share with you from chapter 13 of the Bhagavad Gita, which is the verse 8, the focus is upon dharma, on how to interact with the world with kindness, with care, with compassion, because dharma paves the way for moksha, or rather conscious interpersonal behavior paves the way for 
enlightenment of the personal kind that liberates us, that sets us free. Coming back to the word dharma, you may be curious. You might have heard of it. But let's just look and explore the root of this word. And the root of this word dharma comes from a Sanskrit root, which means dri. And dri, the sound and this root sound really means to sustain, to become stable, to hold, to be conscious. So it is said that whatever is sustaining all the different planets in their orbits, the different galaxies in their different parts of the universe, what is holding it is a supreme dharma. And that dharma can be understood in many ways. That's why there is no comparable one word in English language or any language really to explain the immensity of what dharma means. But I will make an attempt. For example, dharma can also refer to the essence of something or someone. For example, the dharma of, of, of heat or something hot would be to burn. Dharma of something wet would be to moisten. Dharma of wind would be to move. Similarly, you and I have something essential within us, which is uncompromisable, which is non-negotiable. And to discover that dharma and to live that, to be that, is coming into a kind of a samadhi or a state of enlightenment. And this kind of dharma is known as swa dharma. Swa means the self. For example, early on, I discovered that teaching the scriptures was not just my profession. It was my swa dharma. If I don't spend time with the great books and great teachers of the whole world, not just India, something is missing within me. If I spend time simply in worldly pursuits, they're fine for a little bit, but after a while they leave me feeling empty. So there are different kinds of swadharmas. For example, they can be a swadharma to spiritually evolve, which is my kind of swadharma. There, are, there is a swadharma to make wealth, to create wealth, to be an entrepreneur. And one must be true to that. They can be a swadharma to stand up for right causes, to speak up, to question non-ethical actions and behavior. And one must be courageous and one must not suppress one's voice. And that's also to be dharmic. And finally, there is even a kind of dharma which represents pleasure seeking, being relaxed, spending time with family and friends. And some people spend their entire life pursuing this with all their might. And that's okay because that's being true to their dharma. So in essence, dharma can represent what is your essence and leading a life as authentically aligned with that essence as possible. Making sacrifices, or letting go of what does not serve you and your swadharma and really standing up for what is supporting you. For example, I'm very protective of my time to meditate or to read a book from cover to cover or to write or to contemplate or even share this knowledge right now with you. When I'm doing this, I'm really walking the path of my dharma. Dharma also means um, the attitudes that we embody towards the world and its sentient creatures in general. And this kind of dharma is known as a sadharana dharma or the dharma that, that, that 
subsumes all beings, all creatures, the tiny little caterpillar and the ant and the mighty human, they're all included here. So we don't have one set of rules for the people who look like us, talk like us, mate like us, eat like us, pray like us, but really sadharana dharma involves certain elevated, conscious, noble attitudes embodied towards all sentient creatures because every sentient creature deserves love. They can experience pain. They can experience rejection. They can experience hurt. And so the Vedas ask us, the Bhagavad Gita teaches us to embody certain attitudes. And this verse that I'm going to share with you from chapter 13 of the Bhagavad Gita, verse 8, embodies this kind of teaching on dharma. There is yet another kind of dharma cluster of teachings known as vyavharika dharma. Vyavharika means transactional. It is the kind of everyday dharma, almost like everyday ethics. For example, um, putting your hands on your nose and mouth while sneezing is not just a teaching of the modern day science which understands germs, but really it's also a teaching to be found in the Vedas. How to conduct your body, how to, uh, when it is sharing the same space with other bodies, how to, how to, how to manage your impulses, including sexual impulses, so that they do not become the cause of aggression on others. How to use your speech, how to use your uh, motor organs, how to express what you want, get what you want, and yet not be the cause of abuse or sorrow or hurt or violence to others. How to conduct your entire being in a society is transactional dharma. And and it's beautiful because it really makes each one of us responsible for our own sex drive, for our own um, biological urges, uh, for our hunger even. And um, but does stealing someone else's food to 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 satisfy our hunger or to sexually be aggressive to satisfy our sexual impulse? Is that justified? Those questions are asked in this topic of Vyavharika Dharma. In fact, it is so important that Vyavharika Dharma and Dharma teachings in general are even included in the science of Ayurveda, which is the medical science of the Hindus, which emanates and is connected to the Vedas. And it is said that you cannot kick the dog in the street while you pet the dog in your home because we are all radically connected. And as a result, we are asked that for our own well-being, we become sensitive to the well-being of others, including strangers, other animals, other creatures, those who are marginalized, and really develop a heart of kindness, uh, not only for the well-being of our spirit, but it's necessary for the well-being of our psyche and the well-being of our body. So I can go on and on teaching you about uh, the qualities of dharma and sharing with you what I have learned at the feet of my teachers. But it's important that uh, I now move forward to share with you this special verse. Om Shri Krishnam Vande Jagat Guru, we first recognize Krishna who is the giver of this teaching, he is said to be an incarnation of the supreme reality. And uh, it is said that supreme consciousness, which is beyond body, beyond gender, beyond name, beyond form, beyond story, beyond time, uh, took an avatar or manifested as Krishna, the statesperson, the statesman, to give his disciple Arjuna this teaching. So I begin with being grateful. And then I have a Bhagavad Gita here with me from which I chant. Amanitvam madam bitvam 
अहिम साक्षांति आजवम आचार्य पासनम शौचम स्थैर्य आत्म विनिग्रह so as you saw that i was chanting less and remembering more because as i was growing up we would chant these verses and they had become a part of my dna so while i always have a text in front of me i often seem to chant from memory and the good thing about them becoming a part of my dna is that sometimes when my personality when my body and mind out in the world are interacting with other bodies and minds and we are caught up in duality and we forget the truth of non duality it's easy for the ego to become judgmental hyper reactive hyper defensive even offensive these verses come back and keep us tethered to that true self which is non dual that consciousness that we all share and a softness comes over us a sweetness emerges in our heart we become soulful again and the dharmic options for more expansive attitudes emerge within us that we can potentially employ the dharma instead of our knee jerk reaction so what is this we're saying the first teaching it gives is of embodying an attitude of and it's a mouthful these sanskrit words but if you're not i will explain the english translation of each word the first attitude we're recommended to embody is known as amanitvam mana means pride false pride and amanitvam means coming not from a place of superiority and you know we may think that we're not really walking around with that sense of superiority but 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 even to think that i'm different from the all that i'm somehow separate and that i i walk beyond the fabric that holds everyone else is a kind of a manitam it's a false sense of self and when that happens we feel like we deserve more better and and i'm all for wanting and the gita is all for leading a worthy life without abuse without disrespect with healthy respect with healthy esteem so that's not in question what's in question is the sense of entitlement or privilege that we walk around with because when that happens then we can be easily disappointed we can feel hurt we can feel neglected we can feel invisible uh, more than necessary unnecessarily and and what it does is it alienates us from all when i was a teenager born in this illustrious family i suffered from some false pride teenagers can pick up some false values this was mine and i would walk around feeling a bit important and others looked at me with awe wow she's born to this family she's this person's daughter this person's granddaughter this person's great granddaughter look at her and it did feed me a little bit but that's it i lived in my own haze a trance that was artificial inauthentic fortunately it only lasted for a short time until the geeta chanting and the geeta teachings from my guru my grandfather pierced that falseness within me because i realized that i was living in a self created ivory tower and it made me alone and it made me puffed up 
but it ultimately alienated me from all the warm hearts and eyes around me. And as soon as I stepped out of this false pride and took up really the value of Amanitvam from that day when I was 13 or 14 to today when I'll soon be 60, the warmth of other beings and the warmth of my heart, it's special how it comes together and 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 I and I feel so much more fuller and happier and blessed because of dropping the veil of the false pride. And we don't need anything special to have false pride. We could have a head full of glorious hair and we can have false pride. We can have looks for which we didn't really do anything, which was just a biological. DNA uh, occurrence, and we can be full of pride. We can score well on our arithmetic test, and we can be full of pride. We can write well or speak well, and we can have false pride, but it can be anything. And it creates a false self, which is unnecessary. Related to it is the second value of Adambitvam, which really means Therefore, let go of pretentiousness. What it's really saying is both these values are asking us to take up the dharma value of simplicity. Simplicity. Be original. Be as you have been brought into essence by Mother Nature by greater forces beyond you. If things have worked for you, be grateful. If things have not worked for you, understand that there might be a greater reason for it. There is no need for your ego to get all activated and be filled with falseness and pretentiousness in the process. Because sometimes in pretentiousness, we also cover our gaps. We, we feel like we need to smoothen over and 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 create this false sheen. We don't need to. And as I have sat with Adambitvam, this this call to be simple, that simplicity that I see in the eyes of animals, that simplicity that I see in the in the in the presence of Mother Nature, redwood trees and beautiful blossoms. And some part of the forest that I'm walking through may be dying and some part bursting into life and it all feels real and natural. It reminds me of this verse from the Bhagavad Gita that I'm sharing with you with such humbleness. Because now I don't feel the pride of having received that at a young age. Now I feel like I was rescued <laughs> by this knowledge from my own artificialness. And then it goes on to say, Shanti. Now there are two kinds of Shanti. You might have heard of the word Sanskrit word Shanti, S-H-A-N-T-I, which means peace. But the Shanti that is being referred to in this verse is spelled with a K in the beginning, with a slight K, Shanti, K-S-H-A-N-T-I. And Shanti means to accommodate, to tolerate, to bear. What does that mean? It means that we're walking and we're preening around being vain and we calm that down. We're being false and we become original, simple, transparent, but then we see others who may or may not be in this more dharmic space. Then what can we offer them? We can offer them kshanti. Kshanti means a spirit of accommodation. If Mother Earth can bear all of us, then we can also allow them to coexist. They may not think like us. They may not act like us. They may not 
pray like us, they may not meet like us, they may not at all support what we believe in. They may be an antithesis to whatever we represent, yet we can offer them shanti. On this beautiful earth, we see beautiful, gorgeous lotuses, we see lilies in bloom, and we also see thorny cacti. Everything coexists. In the same way, there are different humans, different characters, and we are asked to bring a spirit of not, not bitter tolerance, but a spirit of heartfelt accommodation. May different opinions be allowed to prevail, different races blossom, different religions coexist. So it is this kshanti which may perhaps uh, a special dent on the Indian tradition to not to not need to change what is out there, but to accept different varieties and colors and expressions of consciousness, which is one, a sacred. So sometimes if I'm having a difficult time with a certain, let's just say relative, it's helpful to grow within our heart and find this Dharma teaching of Shanti and say, can I at least accommodate their existence, their difference of opinion, even their so-called unacceptable behavior? What that does is we can be more selective. We can be more peaceful, more calm, more accommodating, more tolerant. And even in different at times, we don't need to get triggered every time something that is not in the splitting image of what we believe in shows up in our universe and we want to change that. But that's what's happening. We see today in the world that is burning up with racism and hatred that we're not able to extend a spirit of accommodation to each other. And how brilliant of the Gita to begin with, begin talking to an average individual who may be suffering from vanity and false self, of false self-love, false self-importance. And as a result, they are pretentious or unnatural. And as a result, it's possibly that they are not tolerant of those who don't support their false universe, but it's really talking to us and meeting us where we are at. And it's showing us these suggestions that we can put into place. And after Kshanti comes the Sanskrit word Arjavam. That's really beautiful. Arjavam means straight like an arrow. And what it's saying is that, so after you've accommodated, and that should be our first instinct towards that which we don't find acceptable, can we accommodate it? Is it so important that we get triggered and we go to war, or can we just accommodate it and move on? But after we've moved on, and if something persists, and we need to address it, and how do we address it? And again, we find great psychology here. And we are asked to be straight as an arrow in addressing what needs to be addressed, which means to be straight as an arrow, we should align our feelings, which we experience in our gut area or in the heart area right here. And our thoughts, which happen here and our speech. We, they should all be aligned. So when, when we speak, we should keep checking in how we're feeling. 
And I, when I started doing that as a speaker and as a teacher, I realized that if there's something more I have to say, to be more aligned as an arrow, my gut should not shrink. It should not constrict. I shouldn't hold my breath. It should really all flow. And I found that as I have imparted this teaching, more and more people are now having conversations with their significant other or at the PTA meeting or with their in-laws, um, with archivum straight as an arrow. And straight as an arrow does not mean, it doesn't say the arrow must go and <laughs> inflict harm. It just says, just like an arrow, whichever direction you, 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 you let go of the arrow, it always goes in a straight direction. However, which way you address and express yourself, it should be so aligned that you should pause and align it and ensure that what you're feeling, what you're thinking, what you're saying, they're all aligned. This restores that power to us because if we are split within ourselves, if our speech is expressing what we don't think, or if we are thinking something, speaking something, feeling something, then we become an internal mess. We become, we lead a life of self-deception. Sometimes it takes time to find that inner alignment, to become into the dharm, to come into arjuma, more straightforwardness is the simple translation. It takes a little time and sometimes you might find yourself saying, I'll get back to you. I still have to think it through. Or I still have to feel it through. I'm still trying to find the right words to express what I'm thinking and feeling and that's okay. But when you do speak, that speech will really be a beautiful ambassador for your thoughts and for your feelings. Can you imagine gifting yourself the dharma value of Arjuna, making it your sankalpa, your sole decision? Amanetvam, adambitvam. So we discussed amanetvam, non-pride. Adambitvam, non-pretentious, as a result, simple, truthful, genuine, authentic, original. And then um, I forgot to mention ahimsa. Comes ahimsa first before kshanti. Ahimsa is the most well-known Dharma value, the teaching made famous by the Buddha, the Mahavira. These are the proponents of the Buddhist and the Jaina religions coming out of India who themselves grew up in the Vedic culture, the Vedic bed, which whose most important Dharma teaching is Ahimsa. And Ahimsa means nonviolence. It's interesting that it says ahimsa as an important value. It doesn't say compassion because it somehow the Bhagavad Gita is a great psychological manual and it understands that we have, if we have been vain and proud and artificial and pretentious, we can also be violent in trying to force our way and experience violent urges of speech or with bodily harm. So the recommendation is non-violence, non-violence. Because when we curb that non-violence, when we say no, no violence through speech, no violence through my thoughts, no violence in my feelings, no. When we can audit our own thoughts, our own speech, our own feelings, and say, I'm letting go of this violent content. What's going to come up on its own is compassion, kindness, at least at the minimum and understanding. 
When we remove what we are not, what we already are becomes self-revealed. So then ahimsa, then kshanti, at the minimum accommodation, arjivam. And these are the ways to, to be in the world. And then we come into the next line, which says, acharyopasanam. Acharyopasanam is a dharma value that's made up of two words, acharya upasanam. I am an Acharya. My name is Acharya Shunya. Acharya is a teacher of this kind of teachings. And Upa Asana means to go take a seat next to them. Right now, that is what you're doing if you are listening to my lecture, Acharya Pasana. Acharya Pasana means remain teachable for all the years of your life. This knowledge is worth cultivating every day, every moment of our life. So any opportunity you get, grab a seat and sit down with a teacher. Well, a teacher from the Vedic tradition is known as Acharya, but there are teachers of different traditions who have great knowledge, great dharmic teachings to give us. If we see a teacher, we see an opportunity to be with that teacher, to spend time listening to that teacher, then let us go there like a blank canvas and let us receive knowledge that can then evoke memories within us of our greater imperatives, our greater options. So it's interesting that this whole modern trend of spiritual learning, spiritual conferences, spiritual retreats, spiritual seeking, is converted into a dharmic behavior and a recommendation by the Bhagavad Gita because not everybody does that. A lot of the people feel that I'm too busy. I'm caught up with parenting or I'm caught up with uh, putting my kids through college or I'm taking care of an elderly parent or my commute takes too long and we find excuses to not be teachable in terms of the topics of dharma and moksha or conscious behavior and uh, spiritual freedom. We, we don't pay attention to it. We can't find time to meditate. But spending time with an acharya or a keeper of those words, keeper of that teachings, keeper of that consciousness, will ensure that we remain dedicated to this path and we remain connected at the minimum to this path. So it's interesting that the, the first line of the verse, which contains the following teachings, do not be vain, do not be pretentious. Do not be violent. Accommodate as much as possible the differences. And if you have to address situations, be straightforward. These five teachings, they are further strengthened how? By the sixth teaching, which is remain teachable and continue to find a seat next to spiritual teachers. Of course, the term used thousands of years ago when the world was not technologically so connected that we can find teachers of different traditions quickly was the term Acharya, the classic Vedic teacher such as myself. But really an Acharya represents, if you look at it, not the teacher who does not just talk the talk, but walks the walk. So spending time with such teachers of any lofty tradition and imbibing their words, their behavior, their presence, itself becomes a worthy pursuit into itself. Isn't that beautiful? Do you like that? 
And then the next word after Acharya Upasanam is Stheryam. Stheryam means become steady. What it means is the world seduces us to be constantly on the move, constantly trying new things, constantly even um, buying books, reading books, putting the books down, watching a new video, not finishing the video. But what, what Sterium really means is like when you're on the spiritual path, become steady on this path. If you start a video, complete it. If you begin a book, complete it. If you sit down for a lecture, listen to it mindfully all the way. Stable does not mean being stuck. Stable does not mean being loyal to the wrong person. Stable does not mean being... Um, being limited. Stereo means quelling this impulse to constantly move. For example, even if you have to meditate, first you need to choose the dharma of stereo. I can share this with you in my own life. When I chose this dharma, when I, when I spent some time contemplating upon it, I realized that I wanted to become a person who embodies therium. And I'm known for many things amongst my community of students. But something that they really remark upon is how steady I am as a person. And that does not mean I'm a rescuer or I'm, <laughs> I am, I'm loyal to a fault. Steadiness means being committed to my own greater growth, to my own greater purpose. Are you steady to your own greater evolution? Do you come back to the platforms where you learn again and again, or do you get lost in worldly barbecues and worldly uh, callings and worldly uh, tumults? Do you come back? Are you are you that steadiness that you're cultivating in itself is a dharma because if our world was full of steady people, the whole world would become more steady as an experience for us. So stereum is a dharma value that we are recommended to cultivate in the service of our own spiritual growth. Because sometimes we may find ways to grow, ways to grow within, inwardly, in a journey, but we're not steady on that path. So we come and go and we try a practice one day, then we don't try it another day. But at least the Vedas say that, say you begin meditation, or say you begin a yoga practice, give it at least 40 days. So 40 days, a number that the Vedas give out, try it out. Give yourself a chance. Be steady. And then the, the teachings say that how to be steady because the world distracts us. The world pulls us away. So then the, the last teaching that comes up is Shaucham, which is go ahead and keep purifying yourself and Atma Vinigraha, control your senses. So let's look at these. Shaucham is literally means to purify. What? Purify the use of your senses. If our senses are too caught up in distracting things, in tempting things, in, in 
it's going to probably be hard to be steady in your plan, your spiritual plan of progress. There are three kinds of sensory inputs. There are the tamasic sensory inputs, which pull us down, which make us sleepy, indolent, tired, cranky, heavy. And I'm talking about lots and lots of substances consumed that make us sleepy and dull, whether it's food or other substances. Um, a lot of sexual activity that depletes us and tires us. Sensory gratification without any consequence, without any consideration of how much is enough. All of this feels good and pleasurable in the moment, but ultimately it heavies us and weighs us down. And this kind of sensory input is known as tamasic input. And tamasic is a Sanskrit word. It comes from tamas, which means heavy and dark. And if you've had one too many bites of the cheesecake, uh, one too many escapades in the bedroom, you've neglected your work, you've neglected to clean up your home, you've neglected to wash the dishes in your sink, everything is piling up, the bills are unpaid. Those bits and bites of pleasure that the senses do manage to achieve begin to take a toll and one six in, sinks into depression. I'm not using the word depravity here because this is not a moral teaching that do not indulge your senses because sexuality is welcome in the Vedas. Good food is considered uh, the blessings of the Divine Mother. But when there is no question of how much, when there is no context of giving breaks, giving rest to the senses, then it becomes thumbsick, kind of pulls us down. And then that's, that's when if we fast or we pick up our house or if we wash the dishes and if we put fresh flowers in the walls, all of these things will change the scenario. So that's thumbsick. The rajasic sensory input is when it's very distracting, like the lights in a discotheque. It's fun for a while, but after a while, it just gets to you. You can't think straight. Your vision's also disturbed and the sound's blasting through you and a couple of nights in the discotheque and you, you, you're, you can't touch yourself. And sometimes we live life in that, in that kind of a mood, we're constantly scrolling the internet, we're constantly gazing at some screen or the other for work or for social media or for entertainment. We're talking a lot on our phone or we're listening nonstop to some podcast or something. There's just, there's just no break in between the usage. So there is high usage, and high speed and high change and almost like a distorting influence on the senses. That is known as Rajasik input. To purify this, the Vedas recommend Shocham on the Dharma value of Sattvic input. Sattvic is another Sanskrit word. Sattva comes from light and purity and levity. Rajas comes from that which colors and distorts our perception. And tamas comes from that which pulls down and heavies and blinds us. So you can see the colorful usage of the Sanskrit words to describe these different inputs. And what is common to all three is our choice. We can actually make a choice. So we can go for the sattvic types of inputs. And you can still go to the discotheque but you can come out of it afterwards and maybe walk into the redwood forest and relax your eyes. You can still enjoy your sexual escapades or your 
uh, cheesecakes, but you will know how much is enough and you will ensure that whatever you are eating, consuming, or um, mating with, there is an ethical context to it. There is no part of you that is in fear or in violation of Dharma, that you can truly be in a state of joy that the whole universe orchestrates itself to support you in that joyful consummation of your senses and the objects that give it pleasure. So sattva is about not just a religious joy or a spiritual joy, but a material joy too, albeit enjoyed within context, within a understanding of quantity, and of course, an ethical background to it. Shacha means when we become stable in our spiritual path, so when we become teachable and go find a teacher or teachers and spend time with teachings, we become um, stable in our pursuit. As a result, we become engaged in auditing our own sensory engagements with the world. We choose what is purer, what is cleaner, what is calmer, what is nurturing to our being rather than having it as in tamasir, a dark, heavy sensory input, or distorting it and disturbing it as in rajas input. We choose sattva input. And when we choose sattva input, we will wake up early in the morning to greet the sunrise. We will take solitary walks in Mother Nature, enjoying her embrace, the smell of fresh flowers. We may occasionally hang out with friends, enjoy what they are enjoying, but we would be maybe the first person to say, okay, it's time for my bed, I'm off. No, thanks. I'm done. That's okay. One beer is good for me. So I'm thinking there would be uh, parameters that we bring into place. Why? Because we believe in the dharma value of shaucham, which means purity, a connection to an inner vibrancy. This is not moral purity where others will judge us. This is our own sense of what is enough for us. What makes us most beautiful in our essence rather than having us down or disturbing our mind. And finally, Atma Vinigraha means we become ready for being this the self controls the self. We don't need policing. We don't need uh, moral pundits to tell us. We become these conscious agents flowing all kinds of lively expression through our being, leading a full life. But we are coming with Atma Vinigraha, which means we are self-restrained, we are self-controlled, we are self-mastered, we are um, self-discerning. We, we know how to move through life, enjoy everything, when to retreat, when to move forward. And ultimately, we are able to restrain back our mind to say, enough. Don't go there. Now we'll do this. Now we'll listen to this lecture on Bhagavad Gita. Now we'll take a rest. And this is a high dharmic request that each one of us becomes self-restraining, self-disciplining, self-controlling, self-guiding, um, self-maneuvering, self-supporting beings. In a way, Atma Vinigraha represents the awakening of the inner guide, the inner mentor, like the lights are on inside us. 
And there is a voice inside us that we begin listening to, which says, when is what is enough? What do we need to do next? When do we need to pause? When do we need to uh, bow our head? And when do we need to raise it high? It really is an inner compass, which is a dharmic way to live. And I want to tell you that it's a great way to live. It's, it's almost like Atma Vinigraha is, is, is the goal of spiritual life, is to become mentored by your own higher self, to become held and, and, and guided by your own mind rather than led astray, rather than be tempted and seduced and manipulated and bullied into submission, we can lead all beautiful, powerful, productive, creative, in genuine lives. And yet, who will be our guru? Deep inside us, there is a voice. It's the voice of Dharma. It speaks to us. It guides us. And it transforms us from being simply users of Mother Nature and her gifts to becoming trustees of Mother Nature. We recognize that we are passing through. We want to leave, we want to walk softly on earth while we are here. And we want to leave this earth a better place than it was. When we achieve an alignment with this dharmic value, I sometimes feel that the universe makes us um, it's ally and we find that there are opportunities to give back to bring good change and to teach others how to live with dharma in just this one verse one verse from 700 verses 700 verses embedded in 100,000 verses of great wisdom 100,000 verses embedded in a couple of million verses, each was shining with light, with wisdom, with teaching. This is the beautiful treasure trove collectively known as Vedic wisdom that I represent. It was my great privilege and joy to bring you this teaching. In conclusion, I want to say to you that it is said that it is not important how many verses of the Bhagavad Gita you go through. It is important how many verses of the Gita go through you. If we begin engaging with and embodying the wisdom contained in even this one verse of the Bhagavad Gita, our consciousness becomes uplifted, our psyche expanded, and the potential of our life becomes infinitely enhanced. With all my love and with great humbleness and joy, with a spirit of non-vanity, non-pretentiousness, non-violence, accommodation, and straightforwardness. Having studied at the feet of my own Acharya, cultivating steadiness and purity, Shocham, with inner restraint of how much is enough, what to do and what not to do. This is Acharya Shunya. Until next time, thank you so much.